Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, so uh, we've seen the structure of heterotrimeric G proteins now. We've seen that they consist of an alpha subunit bound to this beta gamma uh, subunit, uh, which contains a beta and a gamma subunit. And the um, alpha and the gamma subunits of this heterotrimeric G protein have got lipid modifications which allow them to anchor into the inner leaflets of the phospholipid by there. So what we're now going to discuss is the lipid modifications which occur to heterotrimeric G proteins. So we're going to start with S palmitorylation of the alpha subunits. We're going to start with the uh, lipid groups which are added on to the alpha subunit. Okay, so S palmitorylation is the lipid modification that is going to occur for the alpha subunits. Okay, so, basically, in order to explain s palmitoylation, I need to show you the structure of a palmitoyl group. Okay, so we'll begin with that. So, basically, palmitic acid is a 16-carbon, fully saturated carboxylic acid, and it's also, it was more correct name is hexa decanoic acid, and this name is useful because it completely tells you exactly the structure. It tells you instantly that this is indeed a 16-carbon, fully saturated carboxylic acid. So let me draw its structure out for you. So I'll start with the carboxylic acid group here. Okay, and then the uh, tail of the carboxylic acid is going to, uh, well, it's going to need to overall have 16 carbons. We've got one here, so it, the tail is going to have 15 carbons in. So basically, we'll start with a methylene group here. Okay, and how many of those methylene groups are we going to have in the overall molecule? Well, we're going to have 14 of them. Now, I don't want to have to draw out 14 methylene groups, so I've got a trick. What I'll do is surround this one methylene group that I've drawn with brackets and then subscript it with 14. So that's a useful trick for getting out of having to draw 14 different methylene groups. So we've got one carbon, we've then got 14 in these 14 methylene groups. Uh, that takes us up to 15. The 16th is then a methyl group off the end here. Okay, so that takes us up to 16 carbons. So this is the structure of hexadecanoic acid then. Okay, right. Uh, now, basically you don't add hexadecanoic acid or palmitic acid straight onto proteins. Instead, you use a molecule known as palmitoyl coenzyme A uh, to add onto proteins, basically. So let me now discuss with you the structure of palmitoyl CoA. So CoA here stands for coenzyme A. And this is the same coenzyme A as you see in the respiratory reactions, uh, where it's bound to acetyl. Okay, so uh, what's basically uh, going to happen is the coenzyme A has an important file group. So I'm not going to draw out the full structure of a coenzyme A molecule. Instead, I'm going to write CoA and then box it. And then the only uh, f important part of the structure of coenzyme A, as far as we're concerned, is that uh, it has a file group coming off here. Okay, so a file group is basically a sulfur atom bound to a hydrogen atom. Now, I would encourage you to think of file groups as being similar to alcohol groups, and indeed they are similar to alcohol groups. Sulfur is in the same group of the periodic table as oxygen, that's group 6. Okay, so it has similar chemical properties to oxygen. So imagine for a moment that this is an oxygen atom rather than a sulfur atom, then we have an alcohol group. That suggests then that because sulfur is a similar atom to oxygen, this group, this file group as it's called, has similar chemical properties to alcohol groups. Now, if we imagine for a moment that that sulfur atom is an oxygen atom, then we can react this alcohol group with a carboxylic acid group, okay, to form an ester link. So what would happen is that uh, the alcohol group would come off the carboxylic acid group, the hydrogen would come off the thiol group, those two things would bind together to make water, okay, and then the carbon atom here, let me try and draw this outside of the box, would then uh, bind to the sulfur atom of the coenzyme A molecule, or the sulfur atom of the thiol group, okay, and 
oh, sorry, we're pretending this is an oxygen atom. It would bind to this oxygen atom, and then that would be called an ester link. So basically, the exact same reaction can occur when this is a thiol group rather than an alcohol group. Uh, the link that you then get between this carboxylic acid group and this thiol group isn't called an ester link. It's instead called a thioester link. Okay, so basically you can link palmitic acid molecules to coenzyme A molecules via thioester linkage. Okay, now this is then called palmitoyl coenzyme A. So I just want to discuss with you uh, what is meant by palmitoyl. Okay, uh, this word here. So basically, Palmitoyl means the acyl group of palmitic acid. Okay, so that's no use at all if you don't actually know what an acyl group is. Let me just explain in more generality what an acyl group is. So if we have a carboxylic acid like so, okay, with some arbitrary R group here, okay, if you react a, a carboxylic acid with an alcohol group or with an thiol group to create ester or thioester links, or even with an amino group to create amide links, um, basically what happens is this alcohol group comes off. Okay, so you no longer have the alcohol group. Instead, what you add on to uh, the amine group, the alcohol group, the thiol group is this structure here, basically. And this is what's known as an acyl group. So in fact, when you react carboxylic acid molecules with amino groups, with alcohol groups, with thiol groups, actually what you do is you bind the acyl group of the carboxylic acid molecule onto that uh, functional group. You don't add the entire carboxylic acid molecule. So this structure here is what's meant by the acyl group of a carboxylic acid uh, molecule. So when we look at palmitic acid, the acyl group of palmitic acid is here, and that is what is meant by palmitoyl. So palmitoyl means the acyl group of palmitic acid. And since this is what we're adding on to coenzyme A, we call this overall molecule where we have a palmitoyl group bound to coenzyme A, palmitoyl CoA. Okay, right. So what's going to happen is we can add this palmitoyl group onto certain amino acid residues within the protein. Okay, so let's say this is the alpha subunit of our G protein. Okay, so here is the alpha subunit. I'm just drawing it out as a polypeptide at the moment. Okay, so this is a polymer of amino acids, so fundamentally the alpha subunit is a polymer of amino acids. And basically, we are going to add palmitoyl groups onto certain residues within proteins, basically. And there is only one residue that you can add palmitoyl groups onto in all proteins. This goes for all proteins, and that is cysteine residues. Okay, and those of you who know the structure of cysteine will know that it uh, has a thiol group just like coenzyme A. Don't worry if you don't know the structure of cysteine, and I'm about to draw it out for you. Okay, now the cysteine residue that gets palmitoylated on the G alpha subunit. Uh, is going to be very near the amino terminus. It's not the first amino acid, uh, but it will be one of the um, ones very close to the amino terminus. Okay, and what's going to happen is we're going to add uh, the palmitoyl group onto this cysteine residue. So let me draw the cysteine residue out for you. So here's the amino group of the cysteine residue. Here's uh, the alpha carbon with its hydrogen coming off, and here's the carboxylic acid group, okay? And what's going to happen is basically we are going to add this palmitoyl group onto the R group of cysteine residues. Now the R group of cysteine residues has a methylene group like so with a thiol group off the end. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a palmitoyl coenzyme A molecule and we're going to transfer the palmitoyl group off the thiol group of the coenzyme A and onto the thiol group of the uh, cysteine residue. Okay, so let's do so. Here is our coenzyme A molecule. Here is its sulfur atom, and then this is bound to the palmitoyl group. So there's the carbonyl group, uh, and now we have 14 methylene groups here. So here's one, I'll bracket it and put 14 at the subscript, and then we have a methyl group off the end. So basically what we're going to do 
is we're going to break this bond between the carbon atom and the sulfur atom, and covalent bonds consist of two electrons, one from each member. So this sulfur atom provides an electron, this carbon atom provides an electron. Imagine giving one electron back to each member, so give one electron back to this carbon, one back to this sulfur. Okay, then uh, break the bond between the sulfur atom and the hydrogen atom here. Okay, give one electron back to the sulfur, one back to the hydrogen. Then bind this sulfur atom here with this carbon atom here. They both now have free electrons. This carbon has the free electron from the breaking of this bond, and this sulfur has the free electron from the breaking of this bond. Then bind the hydrogen onto the sulfur to regenerate coenzyme A, basically. Okay, and then what you will have is now uh, the... Um, Parmitor group linked via again a thioester link to the cysteine residue that's at the amino terminus of the um, alpha subunit. Okay, right. So that's how we parmitorylate um, G alpha uh, subunits basically. And the functional importance of this parmitor group is that this is a huge great tail basically sorry this is a huge great tail here and that will anchor into the hydrophobic core of the lipid bilayer and that will hold the alpha subunit at the uh, inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer so that it's not just um, dangling around in the cytoplasm instead it's anchored at this uh, inner face of the uh, phospholipid bilayer Right, okay, so uh, that's S parmitorylation. That occurs in nearly all uh, G alpha um, subunits, basically. There are two exceptions, which are the transducin alpha subunits. So remember, there was G alpha T1, which was rod transducin alpha subunit, and there was also G alpha T2, which was the transducin alpha subunit in cone cells. Okay, and these two do not get parmitoylated. Okay, they're going to get a different lipid modification occurring to them. Okay, so we're now going to discuss this different lipid modification, which is known as N myristoylation. Okay, so let's discuss N myristoylation. So we need to begin. Oh, and I just would like to go back to S parmitoylation a moment. The reason it is called S parmitoylation is that we have stuck the parmitoyl group onto a sulfur atom that dangles off the protein, basically. That hence why it's called S parmitoylation because we've added it onto an S atom. Okay, uh, we're now going to look at n myristoylation, and the reason this is called n myristoylation is that we are going to add uh, the myristoyl group onto uh, a nitrogen atom. Okay, so n myristoylation. Right, so let's begin by uh, looking at the structure of a myristic acid molecule. Okay, so myristic acid is also known as tetradecanoic acid. Okay, and again, this name is good because it tells you exactly what we're dealing with here. It tells us that we are dealing with a 14 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. So let's start off with the carboxylic acid group here. Okay, like so. And then uh, the um, R group of this long, well, of this carboxylic acid is going to need to contain overall 13 carbons because the whole molecule needs to contain 14. The first one is in the carboxylic acid group, so the other 13 then need to be in the tail. So 12 of them are going to be in methylene groups. So here we have a methylene group, which is going to repeat 12 times. Okay, and then right on the end, we then have a methyl group. Okay, so this is the structure of a myristic acid or a tetradecanoic acid molecule. Okay, now uh, what can happen is myristic acid molecules can be added onto uh, amino termini of proteins. And this time it actually is going to be added onto the first amino acid in the protein, but we'll continue this discussion in the next video.